You're listening to Leadership Powered by Common Sense with your host, Doug Thorpe. Here's Doug. Well, hello again, everyone. This is Leadership Powered by Common Sense, and I'm your host, Doug Thorpe. And I'm, I'm sitting here as we hit the record button, and I've got a hundred things going through my brain, one of which is the setup for this show we're getting ready to do has just really been goofy and it's all on me for for it being this way but my guest is a is a gracious and a guy and a fun spirited that i'm sure you'll see when we introduce him get him on here and the bottom line is i'm gonna be fully transparent with the whole world i'm i'm, I'm not making errors about anything we haven't done any of the prep I normally do for this show, so this is really going to be off the cuff and off, perhaps off the chain. I don't know. But anyway, all that said, my guest is a gentleman named Rick Cromie. Rick, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks, Doug. It's good to be here. Even if it's a bit of a surprise for both of us, it's always good to be here. Surprises are good, by the way, in leadership. We need them to keep us real. We do, we do. And, and, and a leader that can't deal with a little bit of surprise and a little bit of unplanned spontaneity is uh, is probably not worth his chops. But uh, as is a little bit of a custom here, Rick, tell us about your background, just a short story and, and your journey to, to do what it is you do today. Yeah, well, I thanks, Doug. I, I started out as a pastor, actually a youth pastor for a, a long time. And uh, and then I moved into being a professor of, of youth ministry, family education, uh, Christian education as such. Did that for about 15 years or so. And uh, then the Great Recession hit and kind of took away my career. It was kind of an interesting moment. And I had to reimagine who I was. And I had a large network at that point of, of people, individuals, organizations I work with. So I just started speaking and writing. And it's amazing how things work. Uh, I got my doctorate in 2007. Uh, it was, it's a doctorate in leadership in the emerging culture. So I've been highly trained and in, in looking at, um, some people call me a, a futurist uh, and they, they always want to know what's going to happen in, you know, 50 years in the future. And I say, I'm pretty good for maybe the next 10 years, but I don't try to go <laughs> too far out beyond that. Right. But, um, but that's basically what I do. Uh, uh, most of the time uh, here a year ago, I got hooked up with American Cruise Lines and I'm now the Lewis and Clark historian. I'm also fascinated with American history and and have a deep interest in Western history in particular, being from Montana. So Lewis and Clark are my boys and uh, I travel. In fact, in two days, I'll be back on the river uh, working uh, the jazz over there on the Columbia and um, the Snake Rivers of the Pacific Northwest, Washington, Oregon. Very neat. That's neat. And I, I, I do recall when we were kind of studying each other's bios and backgrounds, I, the Lewis and Clark thing caught my eye. I'm a, a, a long descendant of Lewis. Uh, there's a, and I, I know he didn't have any direct descendants, I think, as yeah, I understand. I, say, I don't know. He did not have any direct descendants. So uh, I don't know which, uh, which one you might be, but uh, we know that he had a tendency to to, to, to enjoy the ladies. So, uh, <laughs> well, there's a uh, with modern science and <laughs> methodologies, there's, there's a way to, uh, yeah. let's just say his DNA got spread around a little bit and <laughs> there's some, <laughs> there's some it pointers did. that direction, but it did, it did. Now, uh, Clark, if you said, I meet a lot of Clark descendants because he had several kids and, and it just, yeah, there's, there's a lot there, but uh, with Lewis, you really, you know, sadly, and, and I do believe he committed suicide in 1809. He was only three years after the expedition. Uh, he was just uh, under a lot of stress and um, just a lot of bad moments for him and was known to drink as well as uh, be an opium addict. And I think he did take his life there on the Natchez Trace Trail there in southern Tennessee. Uh, yeah, that's no. Well, it was that it was that uh, that jaunt through Tennessee because my family heritage. It's my dad's mother's side uh, that run up, and there's an ultimate tie to Davy Crockett and Jim Bowie, and there's a whole bunch of that going on Americana. Uh, but that's another show. We we won't get into that. <laughs> but um, I, I want to go back to the, the whole idea. You you did mention your studies in leadership, and even before that, I mean, everybody that has run the pastoral route, if if that's not a laboratory on leadership, I'm not sure I know what is. And people 
maybe traditionally don't think about our ministers and our church leaders being that way. But I tell you, when you when you really look at you know organizational development and and guidance and serving causes and and being there as an organization for people, uh, like I said, if that's not leadership, I don't know what is. Yeah, well, I I actually start with the whole premise that leadership is a calling, and I always told my students on day one that if you don't feel called to this, then there's the door because you're going to have a a very difficult time in ministry, uh, pastoral leadership, if you don't feel calling, because there's going to be a lot of times where uh, it's you're not going to feel like it, and you're not going to want it, and it's going to be tough. But calling keeps you in this game, and I have always felt called, uh, even though you know, in many ways, uh, my pastoral career, I, I did go just by way of, way of transparency with you and your listeners. I went through a uh, a difficult time here about 10 years ago with a divorce. I, I didn't want it, tried to save the marriage, but it happened. And I come from a very conservative tribe of churches and I lost a lot of work and um, frankly was told by many of them that I was unhirable at that point, that I was ruled out of leadership. And and I, okay, you know, that's an interpretation, that's a view. And I accept that and I honor, honor that with those who take that view. But I just didn't, never felt God was done with me yet. And what's interesting is I'm more of a I, I'm more of a pastor now in what I do with the Lewis and Clark stuff and the the guest speaker historian on these cruise lines than ever before. I mean that's where my pastoral skills are really put to the test. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, let me ask you in your let's start with your studies on leadership. W was there a particular framework or? Well, framework's the best word I can think of that that emerged from those studies as preparing leaders for tomorrow. You you talked about being a futurist. You know what are did you learn or what do you see in that realm? Well, for me, it was a kind of a radical uh, shift in my own thinking. I I like to tell my mentor his name is Dr. Leonard Sweet. Uh, I studied under him for three years, and he's a primary. Uh, probably one of the greatest church historians that, and he's often known more as a futurist as well than a church historian, but his, his writings were just uh, very revolutionary and transformative in my own life. And I just knew I wanted to study under him. And so I went to George Fox university, actually George Fox evangelical seminary up there in the, in uh, Portland area and studied under him for three years. And I always like to tell him, you kind of ruined my life, you know, cause <laughs> you know, Dr. Sweet, I, I, I love, I love what you did for me, but uh, you did ruin my life because my life has never been the same since coming out of that. What did I really learn? Well, first of all, I, I really, I discovered and I created what I call cultural language theory. And it's, it's probably not unique to me, but I felt like it, I, I didn't hear anybody else talking about this. And that is how certain technologies, I call mega technologies, have the capacity to literally change a culture. They change the language of a culture. They change how we communicate with each other. They change, they change how we work with each other, how we play with each other. They literally change the rules. And I was doing my doctorate in the mid 2000s. And even back then I was, I was saying, you know, I don't know what it is, but I, I think, and I, I, I used the word, I used the year 2020. I said, I think by 2020, there's going to be a transformative change in our culture that's going to radically shift every institution. And I could see it being digital. I could see it being wireless. I could see it being, you know, artificial intelligence was even starting to emerge at that point. I could see some of that. What I didn't see was the how. If you would have told me back then that a tiny little virus could literally shift us into this culture, this new world so radically and so quickly, I, you know, I'm not sure I would have believed it back then. I just knew something was going to do it, though. I just never saw the virus. And the technologies, you know, and, and the three... I. To, to get this to come together, I started going back and noticing 500 years ago, when we emerged out of the dark ages into the age of modernity, there were, there were three mega technologies that really guided the last 500 years, you know, what we commonly call modernity, uh, the big one being the Gutenberg press. You know, but secondly, the scopes, the microscope and the telescope, those are very influential in the, in the scientific discovery of that, of that period. And then, and then finally, the mechanized clock. That literally put us into time and space. We defined our whole lives by the clock. We, we, tell, 
we tell time saying it's seven o'clock. We give homage to the uh, actual technology by telling the time. And everything was ruled in modernity by a box of time and space and even print eventually, you know, and you think about church, you think about Sunday mornings, you know, you would go and you would get a bulletin, it would tell you all the order of service, everything was right there, time-based, and we ruled that way, even in leadership, everything was in a box, you know, staffing became flow charts, and organizational charts, and and all that, well, in this new culture, and the, the three technologies that have really emerged in the last 50 to 75 years now, for one of them, television, radically changed this. It moved us out of being an oral culture, A-U-R-A-L, uh, an ear culture, where we heard information to being a visual culture. The internet was another one. It was a, that was a game changer. It flattened everything, everything that we used to look to for authority, everything we looked to for, for information. It flattened all those sources. And then finally, the cell phone, which was a combination of those in the end. The smartphone really is internet and television and everything else all thrown together. But that mobile technology allowed us to have instant access anywhere, anytime, at any point with anyone. And those are all game-changing, transformative technologies. And, you know, in my book, I make the argument, Doug, that, uh, you know, since, and I start with 1900, because I argue that since 1900, there's been more technological change than the entire history of the world. But. You know, as I also show, since 2000, the last 20 years or 23 years, as we're speaking here today, there has been more technological change than in the previous century. And that seems hard to believe because we think we put a man on the moon, we put, uh, you know, car, or cars on the road, uh, television, radio, but we have not seen all this change now is micro technology. It's small, you know, and, and what's coming and I always say, buckle up, buttercup, because here it comes. What's coming are what I call the hair technologies. Uh, that's what's emerging right now. In fact, in the book, I have a whole chapter on the hair technologies that are emerging. And back then, it was just starting to sprout. There were just little, just little plants coming out of the dirt at that point. But now they're very evident. Holographic, artificial intelligence, and robotics. Those are the technologies of the 2020s. And by 2030, Doug, we will be in a a radically different world. Uh, the robots that are coming, we cannot even fathom. Uh, it's very possible that by 2030, uh, self-driving cars will be dominant. Uh, they will be, there'll be more than, and they're nothing more than a big robot. Drones will be everywhere doing everything. They'll be as small as a, as a, mic, you know, as a micro bug to go inside the human body and scope it out. And they'll be as big as an airplane to transport people. We, we are looking at a brand new age. And of course, artificial intelligence combined with holographic technology, uh, everything is gonna shift. The screen is gonna go away. The screen's gonna be holographic in the future. You won't have the screens that we're working with. Everything's gonna change. And 2030 sounds, sounds only, that's only seven years away, but at the rate of, of the speed of the technology right now, it's very doable. Yeah. Well, there's clearly a lot, and I, I don't disagree, and I, I've not been a deep dive studier of it, but um, the what you said about from the last 23 years versus the last century, I can sure see that. And a couple of thoughts that went through my mind when you were describing all that, you know, part of the, in terms of the change over the century, I'm an old military guy, so I, I have been fascinated when I get a chance to um, go into some of the memorials about World War II. And um, just the, uh, we're going through a thing, I'm down here in Houston, we're going through a big deal, Battleship Texas is going through a big uh, uh, retrofit and, and refurbishment because it was literally rusting in the muck of where it was docked. And, um, but to go realize that technology, well, the Battleship Texas was commissioned in something like 1909. Mm -hmm. And when you look at the, the construction of it, just the armament and, and the metal fabrication and all the things that were done, you think, how in the world did those guys do that back then? That was a marvel of engineering and manufacturing to create something like that. Well, now, to your point, we've taken it all the way forward, and now we're in this 
nanotechnology range and the the microscopic bugs and things like that. And I'm also of the age, a lot of my peers are being uh, prescribed medical procedures that they never anticipated needing to do. And the good news is with the evolution of technology, some of those procedures that used to be very life-threatening are now outpatient. You know, you just pop in, get it done, get out, you're done, you know, and it's, and it's all the advancement in that technology. Yeah. And, and I guess my main point is back to the doctor as well, because I was working on a leadership doctorate was applying how that impacts how we then lead people. And these technologies have shifted in a great way. When you think about now, you know, in fact, it's interesting. I have a lot of conversations with pastors about church attendance. You know, there's still some out there under the delusion that church attendance is going to go back to pre-COVID numbers. And I keep telling them, no, uh, it was not an interruption. I, I think we want to treat COVID like some sort of interruption to our lives. It was a disruption of our lives. That's what it was. It disrupted and it's going to continue to disrupt. And when you think about some of the social movements that have occurred since 2020 and how things are just radically changed, you know, we'd like to say, well, maybe this is just a moment. Maybe this is all going to go away. Maybe things will get back to normal. Maybe I'm going to tell you, this is the new normal. Uh, it's, it's a very disruptive culture. And that means politically, that means educationally disruptive. Educators have a hard time right now. I work with schools as well. And teachers are just, we, we, need, to, we need to be concerned about our teachers right now because many of them are struggling to even stay in the business. It's tough. I talked with a guy on Saturday. I was doing some workshops up in Montana. And, and this guy told me, I've been assaulted three times this year by students. And I'm just going, I couldn't believe that. I, I, it's, I just, it was outside my, my you know, because you hear about that. But this guy was, was saying, it's been three times I've been beat up by, by three different students. So uh, it's, it's really difficult. And the church, of course, is, is struggling to figure this stuff out, too. Yeah. Well, I agree with you. Just the whole idea that for those that think the pandemic was just a, a bad um disruption in things or an inter interruption in yes. things. You know, I, I deal with executives in, in a lot of different businesses who are still hanging on to the old mantra of, I need everybody back in the office. Mm -hmm. And unless you have a business that is a boots on the ground kind of operation, like manufacturing, drilling, trucking, shipping, you know, those kinds of things, if any of your work is creative and and enabled by technology, the the idea that you're going to get those guys back in the office is slim to none. Yeah, yeah, and that, and really, when you think about all those jobs you just listed, uh, it's easy to see them being automated in the future. You know, I, I just this last weekend again, I heard someone lamenting how they cannot find workers to deliver. You know, restaurant workers and restaurants are closing all over the country because they can't find workers. Well, once they figure out that you can have a robot not only make the meal but deliver the meal, and you can go into a restaurant, and and we won't go into restaurants like we did before. It used to get, restaurants used to be gathering spaces, and unless you create something very special for a gathering space, and and please hear me, church. I mean, you need to hear this one. The problem with the church is we made it into a theater and a show in the last 25 years, 30 years. It became, it became a theater. It became a, a lecture room, you know, and, and people go and they sit and soak. Well, I got to tell you, the young, the young people do not want that. They are, they are looking for spaces where they can get real, where they can gather, where they can collaborate and communicate. And if your office space is like that, that could be attractive to creatives. I, I'm not ready to throw that one out the door yet because I do think you can, you can create that. But, you know, the, the thing is, is that COVID did teach us that we could do a lot of things at home that we didn't think was possible. And I know that a lot of Gen Zers out there, these young ones in particular, are still themselves looking for jobs and finding jobs where they don't have to leave their house. They can right. work all right. day long in their PJs and they, they ain't like that. Right, right. Well, I think it's really put a hammer in the old traditional command and control management style. And I, I've come to a place in my life, technically, I think the textbooks tell us command and control is a form of leadership. And I say, no, it's not really. It, it, it's a system. Yeah. And I, 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 I really contend that it never was a bona fide leadership 
uh, style. And I think those that want to hang on to that and, and maybe by their fingernails they're hanging on to it are, are finding their workforces are voting with their feet and they're losing people left and right. Yeah. Even the, you know. the military is learning this. I mean, yeah. there's nothing more command con and control than the military. And I just had a nephew finish up his uh, basic training and he's just like the, the, the people were quitting left and right. You know, they just, they, they said, if this is the way it's going to be, then I'm out. And I'm going, what did you expect it to be? This is basic training. They're supposed to make it hard on you. But uh, it's it's gotten a lot more difficult. And that's why I deal a lot with motivation as well. How do we motivate people without scaring them or creating fear factors or humiliating them or shaming them? Those are all negative out, outer strategies. And I think I agree with you on the command and control to me, that's not a style of leadership. That's more of a of a strategy. And strategies come and go. And it doesn't have to be uh, a strategy that we continue with. But the mo modernity, because again, we put everything in boxes and you could put somebody over in charge of that box. It worked well within the box. But now that there are no more boxes and we have to lead outside the box or lead without a box, that creates a different type of leader and needs, requires a different type of leader. Yeah. Well, for those that have followed me, some of the articles and content I've put out there about the command and control thing, I I have always had a caveat in it. There are moments when I believe command and control is appropriate, but again, it's because it's more of a system. And I use the example back to medical. If I'm having heart surgery, I want my surgeon to be in absolute control of that e that OR. Yeah. You know, I don't want people getting creative on how they're going to come together and do my <laughs> surgery. <laughs> we don't. We all need a choir of of doctors, do we? No, I, I want him calling the shots and directing people and they better darn well do what he tells them to do. You know, I'm going to put all my faith in, in him or her, whoever that may be. Thank goodness yeah. I haven't had to go there. But um, it, it, the point is, there are those moments when it is applicable. But for business in general, I, I don't I don't see yeah. it surviving. Yeah. Do you think it's possible to uh, to flip the whole thing over where, you know, command control is top heavy. It's top down. Can you flip it so it's still command and control, but it's working from the bottom up? Well, I, I think, great question, and I think that runs head into the whole notion of what it means to be a servant leader. Yeah. And I think that's the fundamental definition. It is turned upside down. It is from the bottom up where that person of authority is taking on the mindset of, I am here to serve you. You have been hired to do a job, but it's my role to equip you, train you, prepare you, and, and clear the road so you can do your work. And, and that is very much of a bottom-up kind of thinking, and, and the pyramid is upside down when you do it that way. And that seems to be uh, the uh, leadership uh, approach that Jesus had, you know, when yep. you study how he led, he was definitely in command and he is definitely in control. I, you see both of those at work, but he was working from the bottom up, you know, and, you know, I, I think there's a lot of that that speaks today. The leadership, you know, methodologies, the strategies are, are really how he led are, are very attractive today uh, in a, in a culture that's, that's become so fluid and so, so interconnected and collaborative and how they like to operate, flipping that over, you know, is, is going to be advantageous. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And, and I get a lot of questions from my clients about ways that they can maybe think about doing more of that because they're, they're paying attention to the feedback they collect when they do employee engagement surveys and 360s and those kinds of things. And they hear this, sort of commentary. Um, I did some work a couple of years ago before the pandemic with one of the major oil and gas companies, and there was an interesting dynamic going on. The CEO had had a vision that said, you know, our tradition of management and leadership, our framework that we consider valuable is not going to take us in, it's not going to sustain us the next 20, 30, 50 years. We have to change this culture right now. We have to start now. We have to change it. Well, the interesting thing is they had been arguably a 
predominantly command and control oriented methodology. And when they looked at the surveys, the, the, the number one prevailing theme that came out of these level by level surveys is I want my boss to be relatable. Yeah. Uh -huh. And I, my boss doesn't need to be a robot, doesn't need to be impersonal. I want him to be relatable. And, and these guys being predominantly engineers, <laughs> they kind of the, there was a disconnect in the personality you See, know that's a natural disconnect right there if you got yeah. engineers trying to be relatable <laughs> yeah yeah and so one of the things i was charged to do with a with a large team of other executive coaches that went in there and and we worked with over 300 leaders in that organization number one we had to take a look at the framework that they had chosen to to follow and the whole idea of establishing a leadership framework, and I, and I teach this in a lot of what I do, is that even at a personal level, we need to create for ourselves a leadership framework, which is a set of beliefs and principles that we're going to follow. Well, they had a corporate one they had defined. Well, the very first challenge was, well, you got your organizations about eight layers deep. Does every layer agree on the definition of what's in that framework? Number one, that was, that was challenge number one. Yeah. Just, just having that developmental understanding. Right. Right. Cause if everybody's not all in, I mean, the culture breaks down at one level eventually. You right. Know? Right. So, and that's why it's so difficult to, to reinvent a culture. I, I, unless you do a complete blow up of the system, you know, and literally start over, you know, I, I see the same thing within churches uh, in particular, that's my background. I, I've dealt more with churches and at this level of leadership, but usually by year 10, uh, in a in the life of a church, the DNA is now there. You give a church ten years, and I think you could argue the same thing with a business. Give a business ten years, and the DNA is there. It's very malleable uh, in the early years, where you're you're just trying to figure things out. But by year five, you probably have something. If it's not stated, it's at least unwritten, where people know this is the culture of who we are. And by year ten, it is definitely there. And by year 50, then it be, you become more of a monument than a movement. You know, what used to be a movement of leadership in the early days now has become a monument uh, to the past and you can't break that culture. And so I, I don't know, I'd be interested to hear from you a little bit on that because now you got me intrigued on, on your experience in business. But I, I'm trying to think if I know of any church that's really been able to, uh, to change their DNA, you know, that late in the game. You know, if they've been around 25 years, you know, even 10 years again, I have not seen them able to change their DNA. Uh, they can monkey with it a little bit, maybe change a part of it, but it's it's like a default system, Doug. You know, you just blew back to it. Well, I, I think it all goes down to, it comes back to leadership and, and the, the tradition among modern, well, I'm going to limit my, what I'm getting ready to say to what I'll call modern Christianity. I, I'm not going to even attempt to speak to our, our Jewish friends and their synagogue structures or right. any of the other world religions, uh, because my experience is in the so-called Christian church. I, I think inevitably the majority of those churches you see on every street corner are very much centered around who the pastor is yeah. and his personality, his values, his beliefs, his principles. And people migrate there and they join and they commit based on whatever that is. And if there's an alignment they're in, if, if something goes sideways or something emerges and they're quickly out it, and it, it's that volatile, yeah. but for those that endure, like you said, the 10, 15, 20 year mark in some institutions, it does, it becomes a, just this incredibly rigid structure that is hard to break. And whether it was effective in the first place or not, yeah. it's kind of secondary. And that's yeah. what's sad. That's what's yeah. really sad about it. Yeah. I, it's interesting. When you were saying that, it, it reminded me of a story from the Oregon Trail. I do Oregon Trail history as well with, the, with these uh, cruise line boats. And uh, there's a story out of western Nebraska about one particular area. And I can't, it's, it's definitely the western Nebraska area where they, when they went and they started looking at the train the, or the trail, the trail actually was through stone and the wagons had gone over the same spot so much they had, they literally wore the area down eight feet. 
it was eight feet of rock that they'd worn down, you know, and the, the path was worn down that much. And when you think about that, that's a great metaphor for what leadership that lasts a long time. It, we become very comfortable with the path. It was a, it was the number one way to go was to go that way. And every wagon train tried to go right through that cut in the past. Well, it wore it down eight feet in the end and it's still there. You can still go look at it and it's a marvel, but leadership can do that. And, and really tradition can do that. You know, that's where we got to be careful. I, I had a friend who said that tradition, if we're not careful, it, tradition is like a grave with the ends knocked out. And that's, that's true. It's a, you know, we, we like to have these ruttings, you know, these groovings, if you will, but eventually they can become ruts that are deadly to us. That's right. And, and for anyone that shows up and, and is, is willing and wanting and back to your earlier point of perhaps feeling a calling to be a bit of a change agent in one of those environments, well, they show up and they're they're tagged as pariahs from the from the get go. Yeah, it's it's like no, we don't want to change. We we yeah. you know we we like what we got here. You know, let's yeah. don't let's don't <laughs> kick kick the side here. We, yeah. And it's like yeah, but what have you done in the last fifteen years? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I always I always say if you want a simple feeling of what what change feels like. Just just fold your hands up like this and 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 look at which. You know, when you naturally fold your hand, one thumb's on top, right? So now you take your hands apart and you put the opposite thumb on top. And what does that feel like? You know, it's weird. It's, it's weird. It's strange. It's not right. It's awkward. It's 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 not going to happen. I'm not. I'm going to go back the way I like it. That is what we're talking about here. We we become very comfortable in our comfort, <laughs> and sometimes we need to be discomfortable in our discomfort right. in order for change right. to happen. Right. Well, let me ask you, Rick, I, I want to shift gears just a little bit and, and touch on the classic question of generations in the workforce. You know, I, I, we're at a place in, in human history where we have the, the largest number of generations serving concurrently in the workforce. And depending on how you, which sociologist you talk to, it's either five or six that are out there. Uh, you know, in 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 the work team, uh, what what do you see and hear in in terms of perceived conflicts, challenges, struggles, et cetera, that are that are present because of that? Yeah, I think a lot of it is, um, and it's nothing new. This is the thing. You know, I'm I'm classic Gen X. I you know I was born in '63. Even though I was tagged as a baby boomer, we kind of righted that ship. And and most yeah, 1961 to 1981 now is considered Gen X. And and I'm I'm right in that front end of Gen X. And I got to tell you, um, you know the the boom generation right before me, uh, I, I watched it happen to them. They they had names put on them all the way through, and not all of them were flattering names. But it was put on them by the generation, two generations above. So, you know, you, they skipped the generation and the next generation got it. Same thing happened, you know, with, uh, with Gen X. You know, two generations above were slapping labels on us. We were the dumb generation, the slack generation, whatever. And, and then along comes uh, the millennials. And, you know, it was the boomers and the millennials that were battling here. D even just recently, I mean, boomers were calling them snowflakes and everything else. And, and of course, the millennials are fighting back with their OK boomer retort. And, you know, that is very unproductive conversation. And the problem in the workplace is, is that we don't honor um, the, the needs of and the what what's happening in a in the evolution or the tenure of a person in the workplace i mean when you think about when you're 20 years of age uh there are a lot of hills you can die on i mean you're willing to, to take risks that you wouldn't take when you're 40 or 50 years of age you're willing to lose your job in other words you'll do because you figure i'll find another job i'll just go to another place and and things will get better or different or and i'll be okay I, we have we tend to look at these as generational differences but I think they're more developmental differences. They're just, it's human development that's happening here. You know, when you look at someone who's, um, who's 45, 50, 55 years of age, now they're looking to maintain what they have and they're looking for validation. You know, the, 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 where the younger generation wants to be valued, the older generations want to be validated. And there's a difference. 
You know, they they want to see that what they what they're doing is worth something. So when you have the young ones come in and they've got new ideas and the old ones go, oh, wait a minute, don't don't be messing with things. I mean, I created this. This is this is my baby. You know, and these young ones are going, but this is a new world. You know, there has to be some conversational uh, moments where you and I, I like to use the, the R word here, respect. We have to respect each other. But a lot of generational differences uh, can be related just simply to technology and and how we communicate. And that's why Gentech to me is such a helpful read is, is it helps us understand, you know, we're not millennials because of some birth year. We're not boomers because we boomed after World War II and birth demographics. And who knows what Gen X and Gen Z mean? I still haven't figured that one out. You know, those are just meaningless monikers. Uh, what, what we have here are often um, developmental changes. And an older person just looks at the workplace different than a younger person. Yeah. And figuring that out is very helpful. Well, I, when that question has come up in my work, when I have business owners and leaders come to me and say, what the heck am I going to do with these people? You know, I, <laughs> I, I take a contrarian approach. And I say, well, yeah, chronologically, there may be gaps and differences there, but but let's get down. We're still people. And once upon a time, you were 25 years old and you you were ready to take over the world and you wanted this and you wanted that. And I point to a, uh, there's a piece of text that I have done in keynote speeches every now and then. I'll read it and I'll ask the crowd, you know, who do you think wrote this? And when you read the text, it sounds like the millennial manifesto. It's like their little red book, you know, whatever, yeah. <laughs> whatever guide there is to right. how to be a millennial or what it means to be a millennial. This text yeah. describes it. Well, guess what? The text I'm reading from was Henry David Thoreau written in 1863. Yeah. Yeah. And um, nothing you, really changes. Nothing really changes. <laughs> It's the next generation up that has that same attitude. Now, their vehicles for communicating and expressing are definitely different, and that's where a lot of the rub may come in. Yeah. But uh, it was real interesting. I'll, I'll just interject this side note. I had a guest on my show last year that did a, his own study. He was a technologist, <clears throat> and he did his own study on the impact of COVID and the whole technology play and and the generational differences in embracing the technology required of the pandemic. Yeah. What his study determined, you might be surprised by this, the boomers did better than anybody. Yeah. Adopting to the change that yeah. needed to happen. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, you know, to the man, to the population, when you sent the boomers home and said you need to learn how to turn on your laptop and dial into team zoom, whatever yeah. your, yeah. your tool was, yeah. they did it much better than any of the other generations did it. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and you know, I was seeing that too, anecdotally, that, that's, that's very true. Yeah. Uh, so I, I just think in the end um, we need to look at what I call the communication piece. Uh, I call it talking tech. If you haven't figured out, I do a lot of acronyms because they help me remember how to respond, but I call it talking tech and it's T T E C H. Uh, and it basically there's my dog barking, Doug. Can you hear him? No, it's not bad. Okay, good. Well, all right. He's just barking for me right now. So all right. Well, for those of you listening out there, I'm going to keep going forward and uh, act like you're not hearing it. But talking tech basically starts with the T. The T is about translation. Sometimes when we communicate information, we need to translate it. What does this mean? What, what is this? What's this mean here? And then E is elaborate. Sometimes we have to take information and expand it. We have to, you know, expound on it. It's it's not about translating it now. We have to tell, okay, this is what this is this is where it's explained. This is where it goes to a deeper level. And then C is collaborate. There are moments where it's the information is about collaboration. And then finally, habituation. And I think this is where, you know, businesses and organizations, churches again, you know, we have certain policies and procedures that absolutely positively have to be communicated. It is our culture. I like that word culture. It's who we are. And if you cannot bend to our culture, then this isn't the place for you. 
And so we have to habituate people to that culture. And as long as it's working, it's good. So I love that. And I tell you what, Rick, I think we're going to let that acronym be our, uh, our benediction here. <laughs> uh, I think, I think the dog the dog is going nuts on me, and I'm sorry about that. No, it, it's really not that bad from where I'm sitting, but um, I, it is. I'm looking at the clock, and I need to wrap this up for everybody's benefit here. But I really appreciate everything you've shared here, Rick. If people want to get a hold of you directly and learn more, what's the best way for them to to get a hold of you? Well, just rickcromie.com is the best way to get a hold of me, and I'd love to. You know, I, I do. Uh, training as well as uh, workshops. I have a, even a daily newsletter I send out for people who are interested in getting a little bit more history, faith, or culture in their, in their day. So if that's something that's of interest to you, you can do that. But rickcromie.com is a place to start. That's great. Well, as always, folks, we're going to have that information in the show notes here right below the episode that you're looking at. And um, one last time, Rick, thanks so much for sitting in. This has been great. Thank you, Doug. It's been, it has been good. It's been a very interesting hour. We've, we've definitely handled some uh, we, a variety of topics. We, so. we pulled it off with, uh, we, we with, did. Uh, we started, Farf. we started rough and on your, I, I literally, my dog has barked nonstop for the last five minutes. And I I've never had, as long as it's not bothering you and your audience, uh, I'm amazed I'm able to talk through it, but uh, it was rough, but we barked our way to the end. Uh, there we go. There we go. <laughs> Well, again, one last time, thanks. And I really appreciate it. And folks, we're going to remind you that we have a video version of this show over on YouTube, channel by the same name, Leadership Powered by Common Sense. Hop over there, subscribe, give us a comment, let us know what's going on. And I haven't asked this for a while. If you or someone you know might be a great guest on this show, just drop me a line. Let me know that. We're always looking for people that have been leaders in their world, whether it is uh, business or a community. We um, want to have those discussions with you. We are looking for those good, practical, common sense answers to what otherwise might be a really complex leadership challenge out there. But with that, we're going to sign off, say goodbye, wish you a great day, and come back and see us again real soon. You've been listening to Leadership Powered by Common Sense hosted by Doug Thorpe. If you would like to know more about the coaching and advisory services he provides, visit DougThorpe.com.